Good evening, everybody. Quingane Waloma. Good to be here tonight on uh, April the 4th, 2021. And Ninda Shinziki K. Mark Peters. And Ninu Jaya Nalahi. Mansi Delaware Nation up the river from Nahi. Alana Pawe Lakawit. And, uh, Back to continue our look at life on the Susquehanna. The uh, Allegheny and uh, the Ohio Rivers. Just gotta check my darn email here. Make sure everything's okay. It looks like I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Martha. Anyway. Uh, yeah, we're back to discuss uh, life on the on these three river systems. Last time we, we were talk, began talking about education, basically, and how children were raised from an early age to... Uh, be good and decent and generous uh, people, basically. And Heck Wilder described our education system, our way of educating our young people, as pretty good, actually. And now we're going to uh, continue on with that tonight. To a certain extent, we're going to look at the character that develops from learning to be this way from an early age, from infancy, basically. And uh, like I say, this is the area on the uh, map here that we're talking about. All those black dots on the map on the left, those are Muncie villages. And on the right, uh, which actually should be on the left uh, geographically you'll see uh, the Ohio River and again Fort Duquesne, Fort Pitt as it's becoming called now, Aliquipa's town we spoke about her and then the Kaskuskies which is the Muskingum River and even all along up in there Muncie and, and Delaware Turtle, Turkey and Wolf villages So, this is a map uh, of the travels of John Heckwelder, who we've been referring to quite a bit. I'm going to talk a bit more about that as I go through here. And uh, he, like I mentioned last time, he, there's a book about him called 30,000 Miles with John Heckwelder. And over his 40 years of uh, being a Raven missionary and traveling all these miles and being involved in various numbers of circumstances and getting to know all the various nations and tribes and peoples throughout this area, uh, this is the map that resulted from that. You can see he went into Upper Canada where we are now as well. I'm going to be referring to Heckwilder again tonight mainly in his book. And uh, let's just go take a look at that. There's a picture of John Heckwilder that's in the book that he wrote. Uh, in 1818, and it's called History, Manners, and Customs of the Indian Nations Who Once Inhabited Pennsylvania and the Neighboring States. And, uh, you know, he didn't really have any knowledge of the 
previous 150 years that we'd gone through, the, our experiences before he uh, got to know us or we got to know him. Uh, so, you know, what he's saying is based on what he knew about us mainly at the time his observations of who we were during the last half of the 1700s. And I could say, even though he has no particular knowledge of the 150 years before that, there were no books he could read or ways he could find this information out like there is becoming today. But, uh, you know, as we refer more to him in the next few sessions... We're going to see uh, oral references by Muncie's and Delaware's to the mid-1600 time period, 120 or so years later, that he could not have known what those and other statements were really about regarding these long past events. But what this these things that he saw and heard and wrote down show a continuing, a continuation of the oral tradition that we had and, and the accuracy of it. Uh, what he writes about in the late 1700s shows a continuation of culture, language, identity, customs and traditions that we have been and will continue to discuss for a while. You know, I've uh, been kind of going this way and that with Heckwelder since I began this, and uh, I kind of put it this way. Heckwelder seems to have mellowed in his old age, I guess you could say. And he describes things in a way which he at one point says he is embarrassed to be a white man. Uh, things like what we are talking about right now, the kind of people we were and are, and how we've been treated over the time period that he knew us by various uh, scrupulous uh, land uh, speculators and, and even militias and armies. Now, his records in the earlier years show a little bit of a, a better than, a, a different, rather better than you type of attitude, I think, from his point of view. Like I say, in the early years, what seems to have changed when he sat down to write this book in 1818, some 20 years after he'd been out of the missionary practice, and he must have been in his 80s at the time. He spent 40 years, basically, from 1760 to about 1800, maybe even longer, living among the First Nations in the area that I uh, showed on the map there. He knew all the languages and observed and listened to many things. And uh, some of the things that he uh, doesn't refer to in his book here, he refers to as being included in a book by a guy named George Henry Laskill that we spoke about as well. And that book is called History of the Mission of the United Brethren Among the Indians in North America, published in 1795. I've been going through La Skill, getting prepared for today as well, just to uh, see what he had to say. And scene 24. And uh, like I say, he uh, talks about the things he writes about as being applicable to pretty well everybody in this map here. People he'd gotten to uh, know also and have interaction with over this 40 years, in addition to Delawares and Muncies and Shawnees and, and such, the uh, Great Lakes or Western Confederacy Anishinaabek Nations. 
And so, you know, much of what I'm talking about, according to Heckwelder, applies to us all collectively in a way, and we all do speak a similar, what's known as Algonquian language today. So there is a similarity and relationship, a very old one. And this uh, information I'm going to be talking about isn't new to, to many people today. You can still see the character we have been describing and will continue to describe in the communities we live in and the people we see on a day-to-day -day basis. There's just some things you cannot destroy. And although here... We've been held back for more than a century by government oppression after all we'd been through already to the 1760s, wait till you get to the late 1800s. But we've been held back for over a century by the 1970s from doing a lot of the things that we're trying to continue to do during this 1750s period. And... Uh, you know, it's kind of been only since the 1970s or so that this kind of reawakening in a sense of our getting our independence and many of the things that uh, we've lost back. And it's similar to the same situation that the Muncies and Delawares are going through in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s and what the Onatotak uh, have to say about that as we've discussed previously also. And there's much information really that has been p passed down among these nations as it has always been. It's not all the written word, but the written word kind of helps, at least for me and others, I suppose you could say, it helps confirm what these ways of being and other things and events were all about and how things went from a what I call a written and reliable source that many people won't believe without having that written source. So, like I say, it kind of just confirms really a lot of the things people uh, continue to say today. This... Uh, the things that Heckwelder and Los Skeel observed and the things they heard back in the last half of the 1700s. You know, it's all not just all fiction that you hear or read about. The Last of the Mohicans is an example of that, the movie and the book, which was written by Fenimore Cooper in the late 1800s. But it's based on these same observations and things that Heckwelder saw. It's that book, Last of the Mohicans, is based basically on this same book I'm referring to by John Heckwelder. So it's not really a book of fiction as much as it's uh, believed to be. So we're going to go to chapter 6 of uh, Heckwelder's book that we've been talking about. And uh, we're going to go to page 100. And I'm just going to say a couple of things here right out of the, the book. He says, The Indian considers himself as being created by an all-powerful, wise, and benevolent Manitou. And this, again, is a description of the creator that's used throughout the Algonquian-speaking peoples. Uh, territories, and by the Munsees and Delawares as well, although Kishalamokwang is also used to describe the Manitou. And so, all that he possesses and enjoys, he looks upon as given to him or allotted for his use by this great spirit who gave him life. He believes it is his duty to worship his creator and benefactor, to acknowledge with gratitude his past favors and to thank him for present blessings and solicit the, con solicit the continuation of his good will. There's a note at the bottom here I just want to refer to. 
As an old Indian told me about 50 years ago, so this is 1818, it's probably around 1770 when this was told to him, that when he was young, he still followed the custom of his father and ancestors, ancestors, in climbing upon a high mountain or pinnacle to thank the great spirit for all the benefits before bestowed and to pray for a continuance of his favor that they were sure their prayers were heard and acceptable to the great spirit, although he did not himself appear to him. So that's just uh, some description, I guess, to start with, and something uh, of a uh, reference to a ceremony that we're going to talk a bit more about, not tonight, but down the road. He talks that the people are favored by the Creator, and when certain acts are performed, a sacrifice is made, in this, it's such as tobacco being laid down when an animal is killed for food, uh, in respect for the, to the animal, and thanks to Keshiwa Mokwang for providing this food to the people. Or where there's a public acknowledgement of the skill that Kishalamokwang gave a person, Tamako might also be laid down. This is a very old tradition. We even referred to this back in 1524 when Verrazano came through and being given tobacco at every stop he made. Hey, talks about an habitual devotion to the first cause, which is to the creator, Kishalamokwang, and the strong gratitude for the benefits Kishalamokwang provides is a prominent characteristic, a way of life. Kishalamokwang made the earth and all it contains for the common good of mankind. Everyone is entitled to their share. Hospitality naturally flows from this way of looking at the world. It is not a virtue, but a strict duty. They give and are hospitable to all. They share with each other and even a stranger their last morsel. They would rather go without than to think they neglected this duty, the wants of a stranger, the sick or the needy. The stranger has a claim to hospitality partly because he is so far from home and because he has honored them with a visit. This is Heckewelder. And then Laskiel adds in his book that, again, hospitality is well known. It is a sacred duty to welcome strangers or others. And it is a grievous offense not to offer hospitality. And this is very consistent with the words we're going to hear again in a session or two from Muncie's and Delaware's about the way we greeted people on first contact in such a hospitable way to be friends. He talks that the sick and the poor have a right to be helped out and because all things were common to all. Also because everyone is descended from one parent, Kishalamokwang. He discusses that the people are not quarrelsome and are always on guard not to offend each other. Las Gill adds that from his observations that he uh, read that they are social and there is social and friendly interaction between families, that quarrels, statistical and sarcastical and offensive behavior are much avoided and no one ever publicly publicly humiliates another person. They do not fight with each other and say fighting is for dogs and beasts. They enjoy passing a joke, but being careful not to offend. And they are ingenious at making satirical observations. And I had to look some of these words up in the dictionary. I know what Satirical means kind of, but when you look at it in this context, it kind of means 
uh, irony or sarcasm used to expose and discredit vice or folly. So Eckwelder notices that we are rather ingenious at doing these sort of things and that genuine wit is not infrequent either. And wit refers to what's known as keen intelligence. So, well, we're at the right place here. We've been uh, settled on these, in these locations on the Susquehanna, the Allegheny, and the Ohio, probably for about 20 years, up to the point we're at now, say 1760. And we'll continue to uh, live in these places for another 20 or so years as well until the close to the dates you see on these maps here. We've gone to the 1754 Albany purchase. Let's say we're at the year 1760. Now there's still the 1768 purchase of the Susquehanna area that we're living in. Another 1768 purchase of the lands west of the Appalachians and then a 1784 purchase claiming the Allegheny and Ohio areas that we are living in presently. So things are going to change. But, uh, say we've been talking about uh, La Skeel here, or uh, rather Heckwelder, and uh, his observations of character and education. And like I say, he refers to this guy named George Henry Laskill in areas that he doesn't deal with quite thoroughly because he says it's already been dealt with pretty well by this guy named Laskill. Even though Laskill never even stepped foot in North America, he had access and reviewed all of the different Moravian records and journals and diaries and such, excuse me, that were all sent from the missions over here back to Germany. And he read them all and summarized all these, uh, the information into this book that I referred to. And a lot of it's observational as well and fairly reliable. So I don't get into where there's interpretations or speculation. And it's quite consistent with what Heckwelder has to say and others have had to say as well. And he talks about the native people, the Delawares and Muncies, uh, excelling in strength, that there were no natural deformities or illnesses, and there, that we had a firm walk, a light step, and were very swift. You know, these are observations like if you're a, a lab experiment or something. But anyway, he also mentions that the smell, sight, and hearing are very acute. And well, this is very similar to the things that Verrazzano, Giovanni de Verrazzano had to say, as we talked about quite a long time ago, uh, on his observations along the northeast coast in 1524, 250 years before the time we're talking about now. He talks about similar good health and uh, good looks and uh, all these other really cool things that are very similar to what uh, Heckwelder and Laskiel are referring to even now 250 years later. And Laskill goes on to say that their memory is so strong they can relate the most trivial circumstances which may have occurred in previous councils even years ago and tell the exact time of former meetings with the greatest precision. So, again, it just goes to show how, how well we used our memories in an oral culture and tradition. Even uh, Heckwelder refers to 
a story he was told about first contact, uh, similar to the pictures you see here, whether it was Verrazano in 1524 or Hudson in 1609 or some other ship in between. It's hard to say, but this same first contact history, this oral tradition of what happened at first contact is not only told to Heckwilder in the 1770s or 80s, it's also quite set out in a letter to President Andrew Jackson in 1848 from the Muncie's in White River, Indiana. So it shows this ongoing oral tradition that is still exists and being used at least in the late 1700s. And it's kind of what got me going on this history journey as well. Things that men, people from here said in the 1820s and 30s and 40s. Uh that were passed on to them and even passed on to others until today. There are things that were said by the Muncies that happened many, many years before they were written down. And all these things that they said during the 1830s, 40s, and 50s have since been confirmed through use of the written word. And we'll be looking at these actual, what I call, petitions from people here where I'm at now in the 1820s and on, 23 of them, between 1826 and, and 1909, which talk about these things, these oral traditions that were written down and uh, have been proven since. So, you know, these things that are being told to Heckwelder and other people during these times have some basis in reality. So he talks about La Skill again here, talks that we are able to attain great skill and dexterity in whatever we learn. And we are trained from infancy how to comprehend those things that are important to life. Again, this... Uh, educational aspect of of life that uh, can, can starts at birth and continues on. He talks about us having a great share of natural understanding, which I take to be common sense, actually, and refers to us, and refers to our high moral conduct. So our way of being decent and good, really, rather than wicked and bad. Scene 20. He talks about, again, this moral morality of goodness and virtue, knowing right from wrong and good from bad and that we observe a great decency in common life and conversation. We treat each other and strangers with kindness and civility and without empty compliments. These are things that these guys are saying again that they've observed over many years or observed other missionaries saying over that time period as well. You know, things like, Oh, I'm so happy to see you when, you know, you don't really mean it. You're just what they call an empty compliment. We didn't waste time on those things. We only said things that were really sincere, according to what's being said here. In serious matters, we act and speak with the most cool and serious deliberation, avoiding all, all appearance of precipitancy. And I had to look that word up in the dictionary also. It means avoiding all appearance of rash or sudden action. So we were cool, calm, and collected and took our time and serious deliber deliberation to deal with matters rather than act uh, 
rash and sudden without thinking about it. He says, we are masters at the art of dissembling. And then another word you have to look up in the dictionary, dissembling. And that means to conceal one's true motives or beliefs. Whatever that means, we were masters at that, I guess. Actually, it's kind of like playing poker, I guess you could say, where you've got that poker face. You might have a really good hand, but nobody knows. We're pretty good at that. In conversation between the sexes, the greatest decency and propriety is observed. There's no... Uh, yeah, just a very civil and good way of interacting with each other, men and women. Although he does say, in secret, they are guilty of fornication in, and even unnatural crimes. But I don't know how he would know that if it's in secret, but maybe he's just hoping there's something bad to talk about. I don't know. Anyway, he talks that quarrels, sarcastical and offensive behavior are avoided, just like uh, Echowelder mentioned as well. Never public humil publicly humiliate anyone or each other. And in conversation, much focus is put on hunting and fishing and affairs of state between the men, I suppose, and I'm sure... Women would talk about other regular life and daily events and perhaps state affairs and village affairs as well. Maybe come across more information about that down the road. He talks about that we like to hear news, especially when strangers come around and it's something that we need to do to find out what's going on in the, the rest of the world. But... Not until uh, the tobacco pipe is smoked uh, previous to, to hearing this news. And as I mentioned, we're going to get more into these types of customs and protocols regarding meetings and, and, and ways of doing things, such as using the pipe and cleaning one's throat and ears and eyes and all these other things that we did on certain occasions. He discusses that there's no cursing or swearing and that we don't even have this kind of expression in our language. Our language has no swear or curse words. He talks about that there's no difference in rank among the people. Everyone is equally noble and free. The only difference is in wealth age, dexterity, courage, and what one's role is within the society. It says, if you can provide wampum to the chiefs, you are rich. So individuals or families who are able to get wampum to provide to the chiefs, they're seen as wealthy people, and the chiefs take this wampum and uh, put it into the treasury of the nation. And there's references to uh, us having these treasuries by the missionaries uh, of wampum and other valuable items, documents, and such. And that this treasury was rarely empty. And it appears it was held by one person. And we talked about Custaloga and then the Allegheny being the holder of the wampum for it appears the turtle, turkey, and wolf peoples at one time. But uh, Lasquillo goes on to mention that age is must much respected, as we've talked about in education, that long life and wisdom are connected together, which makes sense. Young people turn to the elders to learn how to live a long, good, long life. And then Lasquille notes that, in his readings at least, that the, gen the youth have degenerated in this area uh, during the last half of the 1700s. According to what Lasquille read 
in other missionary documents that came to him. I don't see the similar references by Heckwelder, who actually lived amongst us during this time, but it does hint that things were not quite as uh, uh, together as we may have wanted them to be at this time. He mentions that a clever hunter and a valiant warrior are much respected, and that no warrior, even with all their notions of liberty, ever refuses to obey his captain. He talks that hospitality is well known again. It's a duty, a sacred duty to welcome strangers, and it's a grievous offense not to offer hospitality. The honor and the welfare of the nation is considered the most important concern of the people. And they frankly own the superiority of the Europeans in several arts, but despise them as submitting to the boreous employment. So he's really, and Heckwelder as well, showing what decent civilizations we have going during this period and had going for many hundreds of years, even thousands of years before that. The advantages they possess in hunting and fishing and in their moral conduct appear to them superior to any European refinements. It suggests we simply liked who we were. It says, no dread, no danger. He said, they dread no danger, suffer any hardships, and meet torments and death itself with composure in the defense of their country. Again, this just shows how important our villages and our nations were to us that we would do whatever was necessary to keep ourselves together, and which we did and continue to do until today. They defy the greatest torturings and sufferings their enemies can inflict on them. This is really not common, but there are some records of instances where First Nations men are, are tortured uh, to death and references where they took it and did not cry or beg for mercy. And there's even a story about a man that was thrown in the fire and crawled out and they did things to him and threw him back in. He came out again. They Three times he made it back up before they actually had to do something fatal to him. But it uh, just shows the uh, different way of dealing with these things that we had. He says, we are extremely loath to trade our way of living for that of the Europeans. There's sufficient reason not to like that way. They took our land, replaced the deer with cattle, and have done infinite mischief, especially with rum and probably intend to seize our whole country and destroy us which is kind of prophetic in a sense, uh, maybe more based on past experience and the traditional oral traditions of history that had been passed down to, to be able to see what was happening and what was going to continue to happen, that, you know, as much as we made what we thought were honorable agreements with certain People, it turned out they did not intend in any way to honor them. And we talked about, the, rather, Laskiel talks about things like stealth, lying, and cheating. We consider the very heinous and scandalous offenses. We mentioned this before, that lying and cheating and these other ways of thinking just weren't even part of, of our character 
or something we thought other people could even do, it appears, until maybe it was just a little too late. But anyway, that's about it for today. I'm going to uh, close up. Got a few pictures here of just kind of what life might have been like during this time period. And some pretty interesting paintings. So uh, <clears throat> next week we're going to continue on with more uh, of how things were in the villages in these areas we've been talking about. Uh, more day-to-day -day things, the type of government we had, and oratorical skills, and and uh, medicine, and ceremonies, and marriage, and as well death at some point down the road over the next while. So we're just going to be talking a lot about all this stuff that I kind of got into and then hopefully we'll get back onto the chronology of events and time. But knowing a bit more about the kinds of people we're talking about rather than just faceless events and, and things that occurred over these time periods. We're trying to put some substance and face and, and, and just who it was that we were during these times and even many, many years, centuries, and even thousands of years before it. So, anyway, I'd like to say the uh, Peace Canal Waloma, everybody. Have a good evening, and we'll see you next week on uh, April 11th, it looks like. So, Anishik.